Good morning, Elkview Baptist family. Thank you. All right, we're going to have people still be trickling in here, but we've got a lot happening. If you open your bulletin, there is a lot of information in it, and there's a lot of things coming up. We have, let's see, one, two, three, four. Basically, the next four Sunday services, we have special things happening. So if you look in your bulletin, just on the upcoming Sunday services, we have a lot going on these next couple of Sundays. Um, for those of you that have kids that are in our kids' ministry, this Wednesday, we do not have kids program this Wednesday night. They're off this week because Awana starts back on September 6th at 6.15. So if you bring your kids ready to put them in a program this Wednesday, sorry. We do have teen service happening, so teens, I expect to see you there. But for the kids, they will not have anything this Wednesday, but we will have on the 6th with Awana starting back. Um, we have our Mountaineer Food Bank coming up on September 12th, so those of you that volunteer for that, just remember, give me a call, let me know you're going to be there, and we'll get going on that. Um, we have a, save it on your calendar, we're going to be having a church work day on September 16th. So we have a few little odds and ends around the church, little cleanup projects and things that we're going to be doing, so please put that on your calendar if you're able to come help on the 16th, and I'll have more information coming out next week of what we're going to be doing and how many people we need. So just if you're able, save the date so we can come out and serve together and kind of clean up our church and get it ready for winter and, well, fall, I guess, falls first. So get it ready for fall and then winter. All right. I missed a lot of things that are in here, so please look at your bulletin. That's why we have them. Go ahead and look. There's a lot in there. There's a lot happening. We're staying very busy. We're going to be beginning work on our gym here in the next week. We're going to start removing that carpet and getting ready to do the renovations in there. So if you want to help, call me. I'll put you to work. All right, with that, let's go ahead and open our service in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just are excited to come together and worship you this morning. Lord, we just pray that we would um, just enjoy our time of fellowship and worshiping you together today. And Lord, that we would grow closer in our relationship with you through the service. And Lord, help us to be encouraged from your word and challenged to grow closer to you and to go out and serve our community better. Lord, we are just excited for what you have for us today. Help our hearts to be receptive to your word. Help us to rejoice in the time of worship together and just help us to bring you honor and glory through the day. It's in your son's precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.
Amen. Stand with us this morning. As Jesus was making his way into Jerusalem, um, the people were shouting Hosanna, throwing palm branches, throwing cloaks down on the road as he, this triumphal entry of the king. And he said in that moment, you know, if these people don't praise me today, the rocks are going to cry out. So that's, that song comes right from that thought that we're not going to give the rocks a reason to cry out this morning. We get the opportunity to lift our voices in corporate worship each Sunday as we gather together. And uh, it's just a privilege and an honor to glorify our Lord through song. Join us, um, Graves in the Gardens. empty praise and treasure that fades are never enough then you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied
Uh, the Lord is, is so good and so faithful. I just, as, you're, as we're singing, I've, this year I turned 75 and I've known the Lord for 59 years of that. And I'm so thankful for his faithfulness, for his goodness to me and his love. And the Bible says to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. And this has been hard lately. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Lord, we come to you just so thankful for such a mighty and wonderful God that we serve. Lord, you've just been so faithful to us. Lord, even when we're not, when we stray from you, you're always there and willing and wanting to take us back. So thank you. Thank you for the way you work in our church and in our lives. Lord, we pray for some of these requests. We think of the, our missionaries, especially the Kosenkos in, in uh, Ukraine. And Lord, as they serve you by witnessing to these soldiers and others and, and keeping their church going and, and uh, handing out food to people and so forth, Lord, just give them strength. Uh, just give them good health and Lord, just watch over them, protect them. Father, we pray for Tina Thaxton as she is going to Cleveland again and Lord, just uh, comfort her, comfort the whole family, Lord, and just draw them to you and Lord, just uh, meet the needs here in that situation. Lord, too, there's many people that are recovering from illness at home and that uh, we just pray that they soon will be able to join us again here as we worship you. And Lord, as tonight, many of the... Uh, People are coming to take the, and deliver these cookies, and, uh, and we have the, the bakers that have been working really hard, and I just thank you for them, and uh, for those who are gonna be delivering and going into these different homes. Lord, just give them good experiences, help them to just, uh, just have a excellent time of, uh, fellowship with others and, and just speak through them, Lord, and give them a good opportunities. Thank you, Lord, for our service now and pray for our pastor as he speaks to us. Just give him the words and the wisdom that he needs to, to reach us that we might draw closer to you and those in our group here, Lord, that do not know you as their savior, that they may see and that the Holy Spirit might just work in their lives and draw them to you. Thank you, Lord, again for prayer and for this time to worship you in Jesus' name, amen.
shepherd I shall not want In green pastures he makes me lie down He restores my soul And leads me on for his name Beside me all my days, and I will dwell in your house forever, and bless your holy name. You prepare a table right before me. of my enemies but the arrow flies and the, the terror of night is at my door I trust you Lord surely goodness surely mercy right beside I believe that song just set the tone and it settled our minds and hearts even in the valley of the shadows um, we have a shepherd and he's right there walking us through that valley that's awesome thank you <clears throat> um, I'd like you to open your Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 12 this text that I'm about to read occurs in the book of book of Luke toward the end of the book and um, it also occurs in Mark. So I'm parting from our series through Luke very intentionally, giving a topical message this morning, giving our best, and explain why that um, the pastors and the deacons and the trustees, um, we are presenting to you a stewardship message this morning. So um, in just a moment, we'll read Mark chapter 12, a few verses. But um, I'm excited about tonight's um, Bakers and Butlers uh, visitation uh, program. We have 15 new families that have been attending our services for at least the summer. Okay, and some go back a little further than that. We have seven Awana van families. 
the only contact those families have with our church so far is sing, sending their kids faithfully to Awana last year on the van. And then we have eight of our church shut-ins. So that's 30 people, 30 families. That's 30 dozen cookies. Thank you, bakers, for stepping up. And the butlers are getting ready to run those cookies out this evening at 5. Now, we've got a, just a great turnout. I've already got eight teams of two people going out at five and uh, really could use four more people or just two more teams just to make those runs. So if you're an individual and you can join us, um, there is child care. Bree Wiley's uh, made herself available to keep, um, you know, the younger children that couldn't go make these knock and drop visits real quick. Uh, she'll keep them here at the church, but if you're wanting to go out on this and um, show up at 5 this evening, we'll pair you with someone. It's going to be a great time of just interacting with our community a little bit. So the title of the message is Giving Our Best. And, um, <clears throat> you know, our theme this year is um, through love we serve one another. And let's go through that little routine. We serve one another through love. And one way that we serve one another is through our giving. And the impact that our giving has in the life of the church, in the community, but in the life of other believers. So, um, is the pastor really going to talk about giving this morning? And I would reply to that question, well, well, Jesus did. Jesus, in his three-year ministry, preached on giving quite a bit. Uh, he reminded us that where our treasure is housed, our hearts attached to that, um, he reminded us that it's more blessed to give, okay? Uh, he reminded us many fun, uh, times about giving. So Jesus talked about it, and the text this morning shouts about Jesus teaching a principle about giving. So um, we don't neglect or cherry-pick from Scripture principles. We'll, we'll talk about giving our best this morning. Now, let me make this general statement before we get into this message, because I don't want to be misunderstood. The general fund of Elkview Baptist Church has a, a, a designated amount that's called an operation fund. And I would say because of your regular giving, I will say and stand before you that the operating fund of Elkview Baptist Church is in great shape. Actually, church, you are faithful in your regular giving to the extent, I'm going to say it is in fantastic shape. And the operating reserve by, through which you've already voted to approve um, two unbudgeted items this year. And that's kind of why we're preaching a stewardship message, because we just want to be aware. Your regular giving has put this church in a fantastic general fund position where we're ready to meet unexpected expenses. Earlier this year, we realized because of the supply chain shortage and because of the backlog in a nine-month turnaround time on the production of AC units, um, two brand new AC units re on this sanctuary where we're sitting in have already been put on here. A big old crane. Did you see the big old crane one day? Lifting those units up onto our roof and... You know, rather than budget it for next year and wait on that supply chain, there were two units available. And um, so we stepped up and you approved $38,000 that weren't budgeted for that. And then another big ticket item that our general fund is ready to handle is when you step in our gymnasium and stand at this corner door of the gymnasium and look to that corner of the gymnasium, if your eye is sensitive, you'll notice it, but the instruments that measure it understand that from corner to corner, the foundation of the gym is settled five inches. So it can't go much further before we have significant structural issue that'll show up in the ceiling and many other places. So... The church has already voted to approve to take from the general fund $180,000 that will stabilize that foundation. And then it goes into the slab that is fragmented and broken off. And it's kind of like this. So it's a little bit of a wavy slab. And it's going to pump foam under it and make the slab a uniform slope. 
And then we've pretty well destroyed the current carpet that would be on that gym floor. So we're going down with a brand new sports floor that um, your feet's going to love. You know, as um, if you're a senior citizen in there walking, doing exercise, or you're playing basketball, you're going to love the feel of that. And um, it's a great multi-purpose sports floor. And then a uh, new coat of paint around the gym. And um, padding around every post and every basketball goal. Church, thank you for proving to, to go ahead and release funds. I think that shows our intention to minister to families. And that we keep um, that asset over there well protected and improved. Aren't you happy about that coming up? So, I am just here to say this morning, the general fund is in great shape because of your faithful giving, but there is an unbudgeted expenditure this year of 180 plus another 38. And um, so, it's just a time of year where we're going to preach a stewardship message, and anything that we give in an extra offering coming up, we'll be calling for a one-time special offering on September 24th. It will go to replenish the drain on the general fund. Now, with that explanation, I want to preach God's word as Jesus noticed about giving. Um, let me give you a little paragraph about Mark chapter 12. We'll be reading in verse 41 in just a moment. This is Jesus' last public address before he is arrested. I'm sorry, it's his last um, private address. Uh, teaching before his, uh, uh, Jesus delivered his last public address, I'm sorry, prior to his arrest and his crucifixion to a mixed crowd. And he was in Herod's temple, but there was an outer court called the court of Gentiles. And Jesus was standing in the court of Gentiles and he scathed the religious leaders of his day. He said, and it's all recorded for you in Matthew 23, but remember where Jesus said, woe, seven times, and he talked to the Pharisees. He said these kind of things. Um, he said that they, he, the Pharisees kept people out of heaven. They loved their sect more than they loved God. They circumvented God's word with their traditions. He rebuked the Pharisees for their attention mongering hypocritical practices and he equated them with their ancestors who killed God's prophets so Jesus gave his last public address before his arrest in the court of Gentiles and then he walks through this beautiful gate inside Herod's temple and the room he walked into was called the court of women and um, all the money was in there. There were 13 collections. Go figure, in the court of women, all the money was cut. So in the court of women, there were 13 receptacles where people would deposit their offerings. And Jesus, that's where he chose to teach his disciples, and that's who we are, a private lesson on giving our best. So that brings us to the text today. Mark 12, beginning in verse 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which makes a quadrants. So Jesus called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, and she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. You know, <clears throat> when Jesus talked about giving, whatever statement he made in the New Testament about identifying where your heart is at, he said, look where you're treasure's been put. You know, whenever Jesus talked about giving, he spoke about it as a heart matter. It's a matter of the heart. And actually, if our giving isn't a matter of our heart, it doesn't matter much in eternal impact. 
So this morning, we don't come to speak about giving because the church needs our money. We come this morning to speak about giving because Jesus says it's a matter of the heart. It reflects our adoration to our Creator and our submission under Him to trust Him with our lives. It's a great symbolic um, indicator. It's a great tangible indicator. So, I would start this message with Jesus positioned himself to see. It uh, was very strategic. Imagine him walking out of the court of Gentiles. He had just sent off a nuclear bomb to the Pharisees. And there was a buzz in the room. And they were like, whoa, this guy has just let the whole community know that we are not to be followed But he is to be followed. And um, Jesus had just set off a nuclear bomb and he walks into the court of women and he begins to position himself and he watches how God's people are giving. You know, God throughout Scripture makes it his business to know what his followers are doing with their money. You know, Jesus said earlier in the Gospel of Luke, he said, give. Then he said these words, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And the imagery there was about measuring out grain and, you know, getting a, a full capacity of grain for the, for the money that you're paying. And Jesus said, give that way, give generously. And God makes it his business to know what his people are giving. Throughout the Old Testament, we have heard the term tithe and offering. But in the court of women, there was 13 receptacles to receive offerings. Nine of those were for required giving. And four of those were for free will offerings. Now, do you see a parallel there? In our, in, our, in our New Testament, we talk about giving. That's the word. And, and tithing is the parallel example in the Old Testament. And, and I would admit to you, I do give a tithe. And I uh, don't do it legalistically. I, I just understand the lordship of Christ over me. And, and I do give a tithe. But I would also say to you, the Bible has always talked about regular giving and then special offerings. So we just say, even the temple reflected there were box, nine boxes for regular gifts, and there were four boxes for free will offering. And on September 24th, when we talk about remediating our gym, remodeling it, making it all it can be, so that for the next decade, a ministry rolls out of that gym without being hindered, um, we're we are really talking about investing in the kingdom work uh, through a special offering. So, um, again, um, Jesus sat opposite the treasury. He made it his business to see what was going on. And he saw how the people gave. How the people gave. And so I'm just kind of making application out of that. There were regular gifts. There were special offering gifts. You know, but one thing we understand that a, the, a ble- Jesus always talked about giving in a way that lightens our heart. It, you know, blessed giving may make your purse lighter, but it makes your heart happier. Have you had that experience? Is that, is that the kind of giving of a, of a free will, of a devoted, passionate, man, God has done so much for me. I am excited to make this extra um, gift and sacrifice for him. So on September 24th, we want to take a special offering. That's the day we're going to observe communion next in our church. And you say, Pastor, why are we doing that? And the Lord just laid this on my heart. Nobody asked me to do it. I did tell the other pastors and deacons I felt the Lord was putting this on my heart because um, I, just, I just feel like there's some capacity in our heart to express love this way. So we'll just do it. And um, on September 24th, 
we're going to collect a special offering, a one-time gift above our regular giving. And that will begin to replenish the drain on the general fund that goes towards the things that I've already stated. Now, before I move on to preaching, I'd like to cover one more area that I think affects our vision at Elkview Baptist Church. Many years ago, um, a capital fund, ca a capital fund campaign um, began, and I believe it went by the name God's Vision. And it was God's vision for the future of Elkview Baptist Church. And through much prayer and through much sacrifice, a capital fund campaign rolled out. And over less than two years, people systematically did some heavy lifting and giving. And you guys know the story that this congregation gave 1.5 million plus and purchased the Reynolds property that's over there on going up towards the interstate. And that property is always had a, a it's, it's the vision for our future location. Um, as you know, the county came along and, and indicated to us that if we didn't sell, they would declare eminent domain, and we went through all that, and, and, and the Lord's protected our church well. We've been able to coexist. The, church, the, the school has 245 acres, and we have the remaining acreage there on the, the left-hand side. And as you know, earthwork is already underway. Um, now, why am I going into that? Because um, if you think about our gymnasium and the impact of ministry, imagine this church with the building over there that's no longer allowed to be entered. The foundation goes beyond where it is. It's unsafe. And it's, imagine the hindrance to the ministry we do here. Well, you already imagined that, and you approved the fixing of our gym, right? I'm so thankful for that. But I want to walk us down just, just, just a little bit of um, thought process here. The $180,000 we're about to spend over here, when you look at that, enormous size of square footage and when you look at it will be as nice as it's ever been maybe nicer than it's ever been will when the day comes for us to sell that property this property will that amount of square footage brought up to standard and made beautiful and made better will it exceed the 180 in value as this property is appraised. You with me? That's a good deal all the way around. It's a great investment. We have to protect the asset that God has put in our hand here. So you did that heartily. But here's the concern I have for Elkview Baptist Church. Is that we forget the vision we have for over there. And I just want to assure you. In deacons meetings and trustee meetings. That vision is not forgotten, but we perceive it's not the timing of the Lord to start a capital fundraising campaign quite yet. We've speculated even in the last business meeting, three to five years from now, three to five years from now, you could expect that we would begin to roll out a capital fundraising campaign. And when we do that, we would show you the acreage, the shape of the acreage, we would show you the building footprint. We would show you where the parking lots are. We would show you what a phase one building would look like. We would show you what a phase two building would look like. But we're not ready, church. That's three to five years away before we start raising funds for the future vision there. And then you got to start construction. And you got to build that phase one. And, and then get in the building. So that's seven, eight, nine years before being up there. And these are, these are just laid before the Lord as long-term visions. But we, we know some things. We know that the road that we will pick up from the county road, the school access road, and we have to run it to our part. We know the utilities that we pick up from where the county dropped them off way up there 
way up. They say we save tons of money by them putting them up the hill, but we still have to run them over to phase one building. The parking lot, the road, the utilities, and a modest building. We have 35,000 square feet of buildings on this property right here. Phase one building over there won't be that. It'll be a partial It'll be a partial move of the campus. Just the road, the infrastructure, the utilities, and a phase one building is going to be beyond $5 million. So we're not quite ready to pull the trigger on that capital fundraising campaign. It's in our prayers. It's in our thoughts. It's in your prayers. But we've got something wonderful to do right here that allows ministry to roll forward. So I wanted to just kind of give a little more detail um, we're not forsaking the vision of developing this property at all, but what we invest right here will come right back to us. It's more than $180,000 in value. So Jesus positioned himself in the treasury, and he saw how the people gave. Um, but now I want to get back to preaching, not just talking about our local affairs. So if you will, make your shift back in your heart. And uh, let's jump into this text. Jesus made three observations. The first observation is in verse number 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury and many who were rich put in much. Nothing wrong with that at all. Many who were rich put in much. That's a beautiful thing. And that's great. And there was a lot of quantity, quantity going in there. Now, <clears throat> here's some things that are true to the day of Herod's temple when Jesus was there. The temple collection boxes were large boxes fitted with a large trumpet-shaped funnel. I'm imagining the box was wood, the funnel was made out of metal. And some parishioners would take their gold and silver coin and exchange it for copper coins because this gold coin would give me a small bucket of copper coins and remember jesus said when you do your charitable deeds don't go blow the trumpet before you and don't let the right hand know what the left hand's doing well part of the application of that was there literally were money changers in the temple and they would take these expensive gold coins and give you a bucket of copper coins and then you go up to the metal funnel and you make a louder longer cling how about that well we don't want to be part of that so paper checks work just fine <laughs> Oh, it's interesting, you know, but there was even archaeology. This word's not in the Bible, folks, but archaeology is unearthed, a term from the day in Jerusalem when these individuals, these pious givers, were trying to make a big sound. And archaeology reveals they had a name for them in that day. It's the word zingers. They were zingers. Oh, there's a zinger. They're giving in a loud, boisterous way, calling attention to their self, blowing their trumpet. Well, many of the rich put in much, and there is absolutely no condemnation there. But how we give does matter. And those that were carrying the buckets of coins, come on. Jesus is saying, let's look at the heart. Are you motivated for God's glory or yours, you know? Isn't that awesome the way God's Word has these indicators in it? I want to give you another example of someone who gave much because they were given much. Um, the Colgate Palm Olive Company is one of the oldest companies in America going back nearly 200 years. It was started by a young, young man named William Colgate. And when he first moved to New York, his pastor had given him advice when he moved to New York that he should tithe and he should give 10%. And, um, and he took that very literally and when he arrived in New York, he, he struggled for a while finding a job, but he did take the advice and he began to give, he dedicated himself to Christ, he joined a church, he began to worship there, and he gave 10 cents on the dollar as he earned it. And then from that point on, he considered 10 cents of the dollar sacred. And I'm just reading his testimony. 
And soon, the Lord has so blessed the Colgate company that he was able to give 20% of his income to the Lord. Then it was raised to 30%. Now, I don't know how we knew all this. I don't know where the trumpet blowing was, but I assume this was humble giving, okay? And then it was 40%, 50%. Do you know the last few years of his employment or his running the Colgate company, it is said that he was able to devote 100% of his income to the Lord's work. So even today, some of us, when we came to church, we washed our faces and brushed our teeth with some of the Colgate property or, you know, uh, product, product. So we're pointing out that the, the, the many of the rich gave much. Awesome. It's wonderful. Wonderful. And the Lord is all important. He would say, I saw, I saw how the people gave. Now, the second observation that Jesus made while watching the treasury box is verse 42 and 43. One poor widow came in and threw in two mites. Two mites, which makes a quadrants. What in the world is all that? So Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. A second observation was the poor widow has put in more. So the rich brought in quantity. The, the, the poor widow brought in a quality of gift that was unparalleled. Now, see, so giving is for everybody, isn't it? It's just for everybody. And what it is, it's a way, it's one way, it's only one way that our heart expressed love to the Father. But as we said earlier, that love is one way we serve others is, is how we give. You know, there was a rabbinical rule. Think about this. Two mites. You and I don't really understand what two mites is today, but I, I've taken some time to research it. Two mites. You realize the rabbis of Jesus' day had a law, a man-made law on the book, and it said, do not bring an offering less than two mites. It's not acceptable. She had the, she says, I have worked at this Thank the Lord, I have the minimal requirement of the rabbi. And Jesus said the might doesn't define who gave the least, it defines who gave the most. What a contrast. Two mites, there's a rabbinical law, said you can't bring an offering less than that, but that offering thrilled Jesus' heart. So the two mites are actually referring to two coins called lepton, and these two leptons were the smallest minted coins of the day. Now, I know I'm going through a little stuff, but I want you to get it. These two leptons together made up one sixty-fourth of the denarii. That was the common daily wage for a working person, a denarii. So one sixty-fourth of a denarii it's what thrilled the heart of Jesus. So I went to the U.S. Consumer Report. I went not to Consumer Report. I went to the Justice Department website. And in 2022, the median income for West Virginians. And I looked at what the median income for a single earner with no one else in the home. And I took the median income in West Virginia. And then I did one 64th of that. So the median income, according to the U.S. Justice Department, was $205. The common working wage here in West Virginia for a day is $205. Some of you are saying that's too low. Some of you are saying that's too high. It's median. One 64th of that is $3.20. And that's what thrilled the heart of Jesus. Because... She, her purse was lighter, but her heart was happier. And she was thrilled to give it to the Lord. Um, you know, um, we would say and agree that no gift is too small. It's the heart that the Lord looks upon. Whether he's, a, when he's evaluating our 
growth in character, when he's evaluating the motive of why we show up and serve around here, or when he evaluates our purpose for giving, it's the heart that the Lord looks upon. You know, <clears throat> determined giving is what I think this widow represents. She was absolutely determined to have a part, and she had a huge part. And God saw. Um, let me give you this illustration <clears throat> about determined giving. In stories of survivors of the Nazi death camps, an attitude of determined giving was one thing that distinguished a survivor from those who perished. A survivor of Treblinka, a survivor of the town, of the, the concentration camp Treblinka, described it this way, quote, in our group, we shared everything. And the moment one of our group ate something without sharing it, we knew it was the beginning of the end for them. So, in that moment of intense survival, these people were driven back to an emptying of self and a watching out for their fellow man and a giving to one another. That's kind of uncharacteristic of when we got much easier circumstances. And it was how they actually psychologically were able to survive and endure was by continuing to serve one another. So that's all this campus should be about. Loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and serving and loving our neighbors as ourselves, And that's why we would keep this building functional. And that's why we would talk about giving a couple different times a year here at Elkview Baptist. You know, the third observation I would make this morning <clears throat> comes from verse number 44. For they all put in the treasury out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Abundance is stressed against poverty. You know, another paraphrase of this verse says it this way. They gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, gave everything she had to live on. I mean, that was her allotment for that day. And she gave it all. You know, Jesus knows the level of sacrifice. And that's what's being zeroed in on here. You know, one person's $3.20 gift is the same level of sacrifice as someone else's $100. And someone's $100 gift is the same level of sacrifice as someone's 1000 And someone's $1,000 gift is the same level of sacrifice as 10000 and 100000 and a million. And it really is that way. The level of sacrifice. You know, God sees more than a portion. Let's not be legalistic. God sees more than a portion. 10%? Well, 10%. That's what, that was the pattern in the Old Testament. I'm good, 10%. God sees more than a proportion. He sees a proportion. And He's not so much noticing what is given. He's noticing what we have. So, this is the lesson from Jesus on the widow's two mites. How about that? That's kind of a, that's kind of a different perspective on giving. No gift too small. Now, as I wrap this up, I want to ask you to do a couple things with me over the next month. And I hope you'll enter into the journey with me of preparing for September 24th, Communion Sunday, but just a day where we give a one-time special gift quietly, not in a fanfare way, but we give it for the said reasons. Um, we may make a living by what we get, by what we bring home on our paycheck, but we make a life by what we give. 
I think Jesus showed us that principle. Through love, we serve one another. So I'm asking you to do uh, two things. First of all, we'll notice, just skip forward, if you would, to the invitation there, Bill, and show us the um, ask. I'm asking you to read 2 Corinthians 8. And in this chapter, so over the next month, read this chapter and look for these ideas. It's all about giving. 2 Corinthians 8. Would you read it with me um, throughout the month? But notice these phrases. You'll find them in there. Be, they gave beyond their ability. They were freely willing. They first gave themselves to the Lord. Abound in the grace of giving also. You're growing in other areas of life, but grow in this area as well. They had a willing mind to give. They gave consideration to what they had. And then they gave. And then the concept of 2 Corinthians 8 is they gave gifts of equal sacrifice. Not equal amounts, but equal levels of sacrifice. That's what the widow's might taught us. So if you would please um, read 2 Corinthians 8 between now and Communion Sunday. And then I want to challenge you to pray with me. Would you be willing to pray a prayer that goes something like this? Lord, I'm willing to give an extra offering to replenish the general fund, but I would want you to lay on my heart the amount. You know, um, I would pause right here to say this. There may be some that are here today, and it's, it's, it's this normal you know, you have found a place to belong at Oakview Baptist Church. And part of growing and, and belong, grow, serve. That's our goals for your family. But you might not be a regular giver yet. And now I'm up here talking about a special one-time gift. But let me encourage you, if you're not a regular giver, Jesus would call you to his lordship. And the church doesn't need your money. But we need his lordship. And may Lord continue to give our church wisdom as to how we would use those funds. But if you're not a regular giver, what is the point of action? The point of action is, would you start regularly giving as an act of worship to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Well, here's a verse. If you could back up to that verse, one slide there, Bill. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. And this is the example here it is. I asked you to read 2 Corinthians 8, and it's full of giving principles. But I want you to notice the example cited right in the middle of the chapter. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, he became poor for our sakes. He gave. He gave everything. So, you know, grace is God's Riches at Christ's expense. Jesus is the example of giving. And he calls us. He calls us to give graciously. So with that message delivered, um, I would say this. Jesus is our example of giving. And he's dealing with hearts this morning in ways far wider than this message, which has been about stewardship. Jesus is dealing with giving in all areas of our life. And you may have something on your heart has absolutely nothing to do about this message. But you know, you need God's grace through Jesus in your life. And I want to ask you right now, as we stand for our invitation, that we have freedom to respond. Our pastors would be at the front. And if you need a pastor to pray with you or talk with you, it may be about the subject of being a child of God, renewing your surrender, getting ready for baptism next Sunday, joining this church. If you need to talk with a pastor, they're here at the front for you. If you just need to come pray, I'm going to ask this whole church, would you pray? Whether you come here or there, but would you bow? And Wesley will sing for us. And why don't we just bow our heads and just make it a season of prayer right there in your pew. And we give a moment for a response if God is so leading anyone. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. 
child of weakness. What's the Lord stirring in your heart? Respond to Him. Find in me thy Give Him your heart. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as Wesley continues to play. Others are praying. Let's give him our love. Give him your adoration. Give him your time. Let's give. Would you pray? while we wait. you look up this way and let's join Wesley best we can as we conclude the service. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. How fitting, how beautiful. God bless you. Have a great day.